Hi everyone, thanks um, for having me. It's wonderful to be here again. Um, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners again and say I'm from the um, lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and it's wonderful to be on Gamaragal land. Yep. yep. So thank you. Um, and I wanted to start, there we go, I already managed to drop my pen, excuse me. Uh, I wanted to start by, I, I initially thought, well, why don't I ask people what you most struggle with, with your students, but then that's a little bit too impromptu for recording. So instead I had a look at um, the fact that there is a very common senior economics content. I'm sure that how it's used in the classroom and an assessment is different across the different uh, syllabi, but um, when I had a look at all of them, I, I looked at everybody's, I, I must confess, I didn't look at the ACT and the Northern Territory, but I looked at all of the state curricula at the senior levels. Apologies to those from the ACT, I'm not undermining your significance. Um, but obviously key ideas, what's the labour market, what do we mean when we talk about a market for labour, employed and unemployed definitions and underemployment, types and causes of those, uh, recent trends in outcomes, and in calculations of those, uh, those measures, um, using often hypothetical data, sometimes using the real data. The concept of the Nehru, which um, I noticed that James didn't speak about all that much, but um, it seems to be a bit topical at the moment, so I'm going to speak a little bit about that. Changing patterns of employment, unemployment, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, policy impacts on the labour market outcomes. Um, and. I noticed that some, in some syllabuses there was a coverage of microeconomic reforms around the labour market, but uh, that's not something that we do in Victoria any longer. And some consideration of that short-term versus long-term trade-off of um, inflation and unemployment in, as evidenced in a, in a Phillips curve. So the first most important thing you have to do after this session is to go and download all of the resources from the RBA website. Now, if you haven't done that already, then um, you know that is the first place to start. Uh, in terms of those resources, I want to draw your attention. There's the resource section, which has a number of different kinds of resources in it. There's also the teacher materials, which has some teacher directed resources for teaching what would be considered those middle school topics like the seven to 10 circular flow model of the economy, uh, the business cycle, things like that. And I find I actually use those with my 11s and 12s as well. So make sure that you're drawing on that as well, not just the explainers and things like that. So I would start, so I'm just going to talk through a few ideas about what I would do in my own classroom. I'd start off by asking my students to read the, um, the explainer. It's very short, it's only four pages, I think, last time I looked at it. Anybody here ever used this in their classroom, the RBA explainer? Yeah, covers all the key concepts. Um, and, ask, and ask them, rather than you coming up with the questions, ask them to come up with five questions that they can set for other students in the class. Um, now, obviously, you want to provide them with a little bit of guidance about the kinds of questions. You don't just want definitional questions. Sometimes what I find is useful is to say, well, there has to be a definitional question, there has to be a calculation question, and there has to be an analytical question. And then encouraging them to um, discuss, then discuss those questions with the students in the classroom and modify or improve those questions, and then either use them for revision or, and this can be a reward to them, some teachers ask their students to generate questions and then promise that a certain number of student generated questions will be used in the assessment. And that can be a real incentive to students to think about the kinds of questions they could be asked. It's one of the ways I approach um, set, uh, set, uh, getting students to revise for tests and for exams is what question could be asked about this based on what, um, I'm not sure how your Syllabus is a structured, but based on ours are structured around key knowledge and then key skills. You know, based on the key knowledge and based on those key skills, you have to demonstrate how could they ask you a question about this. And asking students to really think about that, ask them to really engage with the content in a way that I believe they often don't. <laughs> um, they often are encouraged to just learn, 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 learn the details and never really practice applying it and not thinking about creating what could be accessible questions. So that's a first thought. Um, one of the things I particularly like about this explainer is that diagram. Because those relationships between 
the different parts of a possible labour market are very clearly elaborated in that diagram and it's something I would be printing out and putting up on my classroom wall and there is actually a printable large scale version of that diagram on the website. Has anybody come across that? No? It's under, just to go back here, sorry I will get back, it's under the illustrators. The illustrators are the, in physic, the, the um, diagrammatic encapsulations of some of these concept, concepts that you will see talked about today and in other contexts here at the bank. Uh, flipping forward again. So um, after I would taught the students the basic ideas about classification, example employment, unemployment, working age population, not being in the labour force and just be a little bit careful with acronyms there because I used to teach boys and you know NILF <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, um, and you get a lot of silly giggles, but clearly not in this audience. You're way too mature. <laughs> Thanks to giggling, Richard. Um, then I would um, get them to think about the scenarios. Now you all should have on your sheet, um, on your seat, a sheet of activities. So these are things I've created. The first activity, activity one, is about classifying those people according to whether they are employed, unemployed, or not in the labour force. Um, there's plenty down the front here if you want to come and grab one. Um, so Matilda's recently retired from her role as CEO of a large retail chain. She's now living a life of luxury on the Gold Coast. I mean, I hope we're all recognising that she's actually not unemployed. She's not in the labour force. But um, one of the, to be honest, when I first introduced this with my students, the first thing I say to them is, are you unemployed? And they're like, yeah, of course I'm unemployed. I'm like, no, you're not. Are you actively looking for a job? You know, are you able to start tomorrow? And of course, then we can finesse and unpack that idea and get them to think, excuse me, think about are they really in the labour force? Um, some of them are in the labour force. I absolutely loved hearing, I think it was Samantha, Samantha's example. That was really useful for me because I didn't know that I wasn't thinking in terms of, oh, 16 year old, their working age population, they are in the labour force because they have a job, but they are only wanting to work one or two hours a week. So that's a great response to that question. I'm so grateful you asked that or spoke about that. Um, and I think it's also a great way, particularly at the year 11 stage, when you're, to or when the well when you're talking about well-being and contributions to community and, and the relation and the reasons people work, unpacking that idea of paid versus unpaid work as well. You know, there are a lot of people who don't work for money and they're actually not in the labour force, but they are making a contribution. And I know that we cover that in our year 11 course, less so in our year 12 course. We don't really talk about that very much there. <coughs> so that was the second teaching idea. A third teaching idea is um, getting students to really think about how those different measurements and calculations relate to each other and having to represent that diagrammatically. Because I find for a lot of students, they muddle up unemployment, underemployment, underutilisation, of course, a different concept from unemployment or underemployment, because it combines the two. And the idea that there's a difference between the numbers of unemployed, the number of unemployed, and the rates of those things. And so they're very clear about where do you get the unemployment rate from? From what? It's the unemployment as a percentage of what? It's not the working age population. Clearly, it's, it's who's in the labour market. So those ideas of getting them to really diagrammatically represent how those calculations connect to each other. So perhaps creating a diagram. Now, I couldn't draw a diagram. Um, I used this weird program on my computer but it didn't really create what I wanted it to do which was to have the different parts of the calculation represented and then feeding into the outcome feeding into the ratio so in this case I represented um, the labor force participation uh, the oh the idea that everybody who's employed plus everyone who's unemployed is the labour force. Because I think sometimes for students, they hear the word labour and they think, well, the labour force would be those people who've got a job, but they forget that it also includes the unemployed. Yeah. Um, and there, that structure that I showed you from the diagram, 
and again the pen goes on the floor, the structure from the diagram could also be useful. You could be getting them to annotate this diagram that I showed you earlier, the one that represents the labour force, with those ratios and connections. So drawing on that or even colour coding it for those students who are really visual learners who are going to remember a colour coded version rather than a version that is a series of words. Because I think for a lot of us, I'm very much a visual learner and so if I've seen something represented, I'm going to remember it a lot better than if I read or hear about it. And I know I have an increasing number of those students in my class. I also have an increasing number of students who are very averse to reading at all and anything of any substance. So I said, it's a short explainer, but I'm not unrealistic in thinking that if I gave it to my students, I would have to set some sort of structure around how they go about reading it. And that's another thing you can do, obviously, is to demonstrate, I mean, I'm sure you all do this. I, I'm not trying to say that you don't do this already, but these are just the ways I would approach it. Um, demonstrate to them how to go about reading an article. How, you know, what should we highlight in this in here, what margin, marginalia should we put in? What should we be writing on the margins? How do we mark up something that we are reading so that we are taking away the key information? And I think even at year 11 and 12, we are still having to teach that literacy. And I'm having to teach that to my year 11s and 12s because A, because they've been in lockdown for two years in Victoria, and B, because it's something that we assume they can do because we can do it, but they don't necessarily, are not necessarily able to do it. So again, um, that marking up of the, of the reading and, and demonstrating the reading in class. I know, and I know that that's what English teachers do, but we are also teachers of literacy as teachers of economics. We are just teaching them economic literacy. So, um, in terms of calculations, I, I, don't, I assume that your exams probably, like ours, have calculations on them occasionally. So they would have, you know, based on this data, what's the current participation rate or what's the current unemployment rate or what's the underutilisation rate or um, what's the size of the labour force. So obviously practising that. And in the handout, again, Activity 2 has some um, hypothetical data and an opportunity to practise that. Now, you could ask the students, again, this is you forcing them to do a bit more work, you know. I've done the work for you in advance by creating that scenario, but you could ask them to come up with their own data and give it to their classmates to practise that they understand how to do these calculations and the links. And the other thing, if economic conditions were to improve and the hidden unemployed joined the labour force, create, you know, calculate the new unemployment rate and the new labour force participation rate. So asking them to really interrogate and understand what the data there means, what each of those are representing and then how they're going to be doing those calculations. Um, like I said, that's not an uncommon <laughs> exam question, uh, particularly in multiple choice. I'm not sure if other people have multiple choice in their papers, but we have them in ours. Um, and these diagrammatic, diagrammatic representations from the explainer of how, to, how these are calculated are great because they are colour coded. Again, colour coding for the kids who enjoy and appreciate colour coding. Um, and showing how these, based on the current data, showing, or the, sorry, the data at the time of publication, I'm not sure, that's definitely not the current data at the moment, but you could get, you could extract the current data, ask the kids to go and extract the current data and do these calculations based on the data, not just go and collect that data. Um, so there's the two, um, the two different measures there. Um, another one is, uh, again, this is something that gets covered in uh, multiple choice quite commonly and has been covered in short answer questions in the Victorian syllabus for certain, you know, differentiating between types of unemployment um, and those old favourites. And that was actually a question I had for James before. So James, if medium term unemployment is what we would call cyclical unemployment, is short term what we would probably call frictional? and long term is sort of a combination of structural and hardcore. Oh, so there you go. I would be showing them that graph and getting them to talk about that, you know, making that real for them. This is how the RBA characterises these types of unemployment. Yeah, okay. So that you, I hope you remember the graph I'm talking about, the one that showed, yeah, great. Um, and I'm assuming they were the percentage point contributions to the unemployment rate that were in that diagram. It looked like it, 
Like one was about three, one was about two. Yeah, yeah, cool, great. Great. Um, now, in terms of this activity, it's fairly straightforward, um, but what it does get you to do with the kids or get them to do is really think about what each of these would look like. And it's also a, a potential bouncing off point for you to say to them, so what are the implications of this for these people? Because I know that in our syllabus, we're asked at year 11 and year 12 to think about the consequences of ongoing unemployment and think about what happens when unemployment is too high and that the effect, the effect on st people's standard of living and well-being in society. Um, there was a great conversation on, on, I'm not sure if you saw it on the 7.30 report earlier this week, I think it was, where there were a number of economists talking about Oh, effectively the Phillips curve. So we're talking about the unemployment uh, inflation trade-off and there was a, a couple of economists who said, oh no, no, inflation's much worse than unemployment and then there were others who were saying, you know, unemployment's much worse than inflation. I'd encourage you to go and have a look at it because it really got me thinking about, you know, that trade-off and also it felt very real world because those people were talking about what's happening right now. Um, and I'd be showing it to my year 12 class because it's so accessible. Anyway, so this asks the students to classify the different types of unemployment. Now, how I would do this, um, and I have to say the credit goes to Anita Forsyth who taught me at university, um, complete legend. She was my method lecturer and she, ca she gave us these ideas and I've adjusted them over the years. But you give, give out a scenario to each student in the class and they sit down and they work out you know, what do I think it is, then they read out their scenario and the rest of the class has to tell them what they think that scenario is. And it's a way of engaging the students, it's asking them, it's giving them time without too much pressure to actually look at the scenario and say, so if that scenario, you know, I, I can make sense of that scenario and if I have to, I can look at my textbook. So it's not like saying everyone put their hand up and answer a question, it's, it, but it is asking them to participate and contribute. Um, and there's enough scenarios there for most classes, I think. Um, and look, you can also then say to them, go away and write me a scenario for each of the types of unemployment. Um, like I said, we do occasionally get questions like on this um, on exams. Uh, again, let's share it with the class, get them to justify their classifications. And it also means you, it, um, you're also getting them to really think about the difference between that hidden unemployment discouraged job seekers and the disguised unemployment underemployment, which students often mix up, of course. To be honest, I often mix it up myself, so you know, have to sometimes check my thinking. Um, another idea that we often get asked about in exams is cyclical versus structural unemployment, the causes and perhaps the policy responses as well. So. I particularly like this diagram because it actually doesn't come from any explainers that relate to unemployment, it comes from the economic growth explainer that the RBA has created. But I use this all the time, this, this, this um, business cycle diagram and its representation I use a lot in my classes. I use it when I introduce the concept of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. I use it particularly when I'm talking about um, the goals, the macroeconomic goals that we teach about in Victoria, which are probably common, I'd say, to most states. For us, it's full employment, strong and sustainable economic growth and price stability, low inflation. And I talk, use it when I talk about when I introduce budgetary policy and, and monetary policy. So sorry, we refer to it as budgetary slash fiscal policy and uh, monetary policy, so policy interventions in the economy. So <clears throat> it, because it is graphically representing very easily that gap between potential output and actual output, in other words, ag supply and ag demand <laughs> effectively, because it's talking about showing that gap, represent, like it's representing that for students, they find it a lot easier. And so I'm able to say things like, you know, it, where in that diagram are we going to be seeing cyclical unemployment? Where in that diagram is there going to be possibly structural unemployment? And ask them to identify that. And that helps them make the connection to the business cycle. And then I also, when I'm talking about policy, I'm using this diagram to say, what is the government actually, what are the government and government agencies like, are actually trying to do with policy. They are trying 
to reduce the gap between the dark green line and the light green line. They are trying to smooth out the economic cycle, particularly with those aggregate demand management policies. And with, that, with any policies that are designed to improve the supply side conditions in the economy, they are attempting to either increase the rate of growth or shift that potential to the right effectively. So they, <coughs> so it's just, I just find it very useful because, well, I find it useful because I can see it, but I think students find it useful too. They can keep going back to that idea. And, and what it's useful for me about it is it ties together things they start off with talking about the business cycle at the start of year 12, <laughs> and they're still talking about in terms of policy at the end of year 12 and they can see it representationally. And I think that was sort of what Lucy was doing this morning too when she was talking about the shifting, <laughs> shifting supply curve and the shifting demand curve and demand and supply inflation. Um, and then tease out for them those different policy responses to the different causes of unemployment. I haven't gone into any detail about that because there's not much on that in the, um, in the explainer, but obviously the key focus for the RBA is going to be more cyclical than structural unemployment. They have very different solutions. Um, another idea is looking at that relationship between the participation rate and the unemployment rate. I'm not sure if that's covered in your syllabuses, but in ours, the students are asked to think about, you know, how does the change in unemployment affect participation? How does participation changes affect unemployment in both, in each direction? And so asking them to have a look at a graph chart and say, well, look, what's happened to the participation rate? What's happened to the unemployment rate? Can we see that inverse relationship there and what's causing that? Um, and asking them to, to unpack that and teaching them at the same time analyzing, analyzing charts. Now, if you aren't already using it and you're not, if, you, if uh, most teachers in this room may very well be quite confident using charts with their students, but um, for any teacher who's not or who feels like they would like to give their students a resource to develop those skills, the reading and analysing, um, sorry, reading and interpreting charts activities on the RBA website are sensational. So it's basically a, a pack of things. It's a couple of videos from one of the educators here, one of the, um, the what is he? An, yeah, he's an economist, but he works, he works in your education team called Gigi and Gigi uh, has created a few videos about you know why charts are so great how to read them and then there's an applied activity where they're given a chart and in in this worksheet and they work their way through interpreting it and it develops those skills in analyzing charts um, you know look for us that possibly comes you know second nature if, if we've done that kind of study at university but um, I think if it particularly teachers who might be teaching out of field or have, haven't used a lot of charts recently, it's also an incredibly useful resource. The videos are accessible reasonably short and the worksheet's great too. Uh, so uh, that's a, that resource is fantastic. Um, and this was something that James talked about was that idea about wages and unemployment and particularly job vacancies and whether we're going to see, get them talking about whether we're going to see wage growth, more wage growth, um, as a result of those unemployed people per job vacancy numbers falling substantially and get them thinking through again those relationships, you know, which is causing which and reading the charts and making those simple connections. Um, obviously this is going to lead into Nehru, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about. Um, but um, you know, is there, any, is there actually evidence of um, that relationship where as the unemployment rate has gone down or where the unemployed people available for job vacancies has gone down, there has been accelerating um, wage growth. And yet there is in this chart, there hasn't necessarily been in the past, but perhaps we're actually hitting that point in the economy where we're going to see that start to happen. Um, and it also gives you a chance to talk about real versus nominal wages because that's something obviously students are starting to think, uh, well I would assume they're thinking about because everyone else is thinking about it, it's been talked about a lot. The idea that if our wage growth, our nominal wage growth is slower than our, our um, than inflation then our, our real wages are falling. And that is that was much discussed prior to the election um, and has sort of 
not been quite as strongly topical recently, but it, it's, it's a valuable way of looking at it because that wage, wage price index data is a nominal measure. It is not a real measure. So if you think about it, wage growth, nominal wage growth of less than 2.5% with an inflation rate of 5.1% is not a growth in, in real wages. Um, and it's worth students understanding that as well. Um, the Nehru. <clears throat> so I don't know about you guys, but you know, I find students trip over the Nehru a lot and they, they, are, they are a bit um, sloppy in the way that they talk or think about it. I find a lot of students say things like, the Nehru is an unemployment rate of X you know, 4%, 4.5%. No, that's not what the Nehru is. You want them thinking about the fact that, what is the Nehru? What is it designed to measure? Well, it's designed to measure the lowest possible rate of unemployment that can occur without wage growth accelerating. That's really, are you nodding your head? Am I right? Great, excellent, am I right? Good. So I really want them to understand that. And, and I was really pleased when Lucy said this morning, and I think you mentioned it again today, James, it can't be observed directly. It's something we impute from the economy because we get to the point of unemployment where wages start accelerating, or perhaps we've hit, perhaps, perhaps we've hit full employment. Um, but it is important, and this is, this is another one of my big passions around ec the teaching of economics. It's students get frustrated with me because I'm quite pedantic about my definitions, but at, about the concepts and the accurate use of language because the accurate use of language is how we make sure that we are clear about what we are explaining. And so they get frustrated, but we do have to be accurate when we talk about the Nehru. We can't just say the Nehru is this rate. You know, we need to say to them, what does the Nehru actually mean? Why does it matter? And the explainer that the RBA has produced is excellent. Again, I would encourage you, there are copies of all of these out on the, um, if you haven't picked them up already, out on the tables in the waiting area. Make sure you grab them and also obviously they're available on the RBA website. Um, this graph is terrific as well. <laughs> it's again another one, it, it looks not dissimilar to the previous one I showed you because of the colouring, but it's, it's that gap idea. So the idea that if unemployment is lower than that, Nehru rate, that idea of the lowest rate we can have before we start to accelerate wage growth um, and prices, then we're going to have higher inflation and the inverse when unemployment is below that Nehru. So um, interesting, the Nehru is trending downwards, James. Is there a reason for that? I'm just curious. You might have to tell us that at the end when, the, when you answer questions yeah. again. Yeah. yeah? Cool. Great. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, I just, I, again, graphic representation of information, fantastic for students. Uh, okay, now these are things that aren't necessarily specifically related, that I'm going to talk about now for a couple of minutes, that aren't necessarily related to the teaching of employment, unemployment, the labour market. But if you haven't already used the digital, digital interactives on the RBA website, you are missing out. You're being shortchanged and your students need to be using them as well. Because what they are is a bespoke chart generator. You pick what you would like to plot, you pick the periods between which you would like it to be plotted and it plots you the chart. You can download it as a, P, as a um, Excel, I think, no, as a, as a P, PNG, as a, v, as, a, as a picture file. And it, it allows you to, to compare a, a decent range of data uh, not everything, you know. If I, I would be, a, you know, if I had my druthers, it'd have everything on it. But it does have a lot of lot of data on it that you can do that comparison for, and it's um, it allows you, for example, and I've used it for this purpose to create bespoke charts for your class for assessments in particular, and for them to create bespoke charts for their assessments, for their assignments that they might be doing. And the reason why, one of the reasons I find it so useful is because a lot of the chart pack data is great, but it goes back to like 1994 or 1964 or 1959. And you know, my students don't really need to know about that. They really want to, you know, I want them to be able to see the last 10 years maybe, and then I focus in on the last three years. So for us, it's very useful to be able to summarize that down, to narrow that down. Um, the other one that you should definitely be using is the Inflation Explorer because it's an absolute cack and fun to do. Because what you do, if, has anybody here used it? 
Yeah, it's fantastic. And it's great for younger kids, but it's also really good for the year 11s and 12s. Show, you know, you, you pick two items or you pick the whole basket and you say, if it had cost me $100 in this year, then it's going to cost me this much in this year. And they're just like, oh, OK, I get it. That's inflation. And for kids for whom these are all just airy fairy conceptual ideas, all of a sudden they are looking at things like the fact that the clothing that they buy now is they would spend less to buy the same clothing now than they bought than I would have paid when I was their age, um, and but they're paying a lot more for the parents paying a lot for the petrol or housing or whatever, and it and it and it's just great. I just cannot rate it enough. It's a brilliant resource. So get in get into it would be my suggestion. Um, the other thing that I'd encourage you to get the kids to do, this is another worksheet. It's about um, analysing Australia's economic performance. So it provides you with guidance on how to do this. It talks you through how to use the RBA's digital interactive snapshot, the bespoke chart generator that I was just talking about. Students collect the latest data on key indicators. It teaches them how to describe trends. It tells them about possible reasons for trends. Um, it gets them to think about comparing that to longer term trends and shows them how to create a chart that will compare it to the longer term trends and then write a statement summarising recent performance. So if you're getting your kids to think about how the economy is going, this is a great activity for them. And it's totally accessible, I think, for anybody really from year nine up if you're teaching the younger kids. Um, you may have already you may already do this in your classroom, and I used to do this um, even before I was up here with the RBA um, doing the EAP work. Getting the kids to think about if I was on the board of the of the RBA, what would I be doing about the cash rate this month? This talks you through how to actually do it. So um, it, it has a series of steps. The first step is that you find out what the current conditions are and one of the ways to do that is to go and have a look at the chart pack. The chart pack is basically, I think, mostly the collection of charts that are presented by Lucy to the board at their meetings. Um, and there is a present, there's that, 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 and then there's a monetary policy and current economic conditions presentation that is updated, I think, each time there's a board meeting or quarterly? Quarterly, after the statement of monetary policy. Yeah, so statement on monetary policy. Um, and that's really useful. That's in the presentations under education. So they go and they collect information about each of these, echo growth, inflation, unemployment, wages growth, consumption, household debt, investment, terms of trade, exchange rate, global economic conditions. Um, that's a big one at the moment. They gather the evidence, then they present they might just choose one indicator, for example, and present that to the class and then explain what the indicator says about the economy, make a recommendation based on that and then have a discussion as a board and make a vote. Now, I know that takes time. That's something I'd be more likely to do with year 11s and year 12s. But, it, but even if you talk them through that process of how this decision is made, that is a really useful approach. Um, there's always a selection of great charts available and um, sometimes it's worth comparing charts, you know, what seems to, what is, what is this information, what would we conclude here about recent CPI and unemployment figures in terms of how it might influence the RBA's monetary policy decision. Um, and then they write up their response and then they check their decision compared to what the board actually decides. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we do at the earlier years of economics that we don't do quite so much at the later years, I think, is to think about the impacts of decisions on different groups and stakeholder groups. And this activity is great for that. It gets them to really think about, from the perspective of different people in the economy, what would I, what, what would this particular monetary policy decision mean? So, for example, um, you possibly can't see it, but different individuals, um, business, different kinds of businesses. And so it asks you to think about those decisions from different perspectives. One of the things that struck me the first time I heard um, Philip Lowe, Dr Lowe speak, was he talked about how every time he changes the cash rate, he gets letters from different stakeholders. So when he puts it up, he gets letters from homeowners saying, you know, my mortgage has become too expensive, I'm going to have to sell my house. But when he puts it down, he gets um, letters from self-funded retirees saying, hang on a sec, what about me? <laughs> you know, how am I supposed to survive on the kind of money I'm getting from my, from my term deposits or whatever? So looking at it from different perspectives. Um, and again, it's one of those very interactive activities that engages the whole class. 
So I also am a genuine believer in ec ec economicsifying your classroom as much as you can. I'm lucky enough to teach my two senior classes in the same classroom fairly consistently. I mean, I'm all over the shop with the other kids, but with the senior kids, I'm able to put stuff up on the walls. So there's so many things you can print out. I, in I talked to you about the illustrators. So there's just a few examples of the illustrators, the reading and interpreting cards illustrator, the types of unemployment illustrator. The other thing um, is, also thinking about regularly showing the summary of current economic conditions. So that comes out after each meeting, is that right? The, the video on the summary of... It's quarterly as well. It's quarterly as well. Oh, sorry, after each statement on monetary policy. So after each statement on monetary policy, quarterly, an economist from the bank presents a, a summary of the current economic conditions and it's very accessible. So it's summarising the basis for those decisions that the bank, has, the board has made. Um, I would obviously, re I regularly use charts and diagrams from the RBA and other sources on assessments in class, getting the kids using real data. Um, I've already talked about the summary of economic conditions video. Now, I teach only girls at this stage. I have taught boys in the past. I've taught co-ed. Um, I've taught across sectors. So I've taught in the private and the public. But these days, I, I'm at a, a private girls school. And one of the big issues for me is getting girls excited about economics and feeling confident about economics. If you teach girls in your economics class, you have to read this article. It's all about, and it, it basically, and can I just say, a student of mine from high school wrote it, she now works here, um, the fabulous Joyce Tan. And she, she found that there is a gap between how confident girls feel about their economics understanding and how confident, how capable they really are, so their actual proficiency. And that gap is quite significant. The good news is we can work to make that gap smaller and I know that we can't necessarily change everything that influences that gap. But one thing that does influence that gap is having a female teacher. It makes the gap smaller, a female economics teacher. So um, hats off to the female economics teachers in the room and hats off to the men in the room who are, are making an effort to ensure the girls in the, in the classroom are feeling engaged and supported in, the, in, that, in that learning environment. So I really encourage you to read that article. Uh, some great lessons there. Um, and also, I've got these posters all over, all over the school, Women in Economics. Uh, they're a few years old now, so I mean, I think Lucy's got grey hair and some of those people have moved on from some of those roles. But a lot of those people are still out there as really prominent ec economists. You know, and when you're thinking about examples you can use, try to be a little bit less predictable. You know, the farmer isn't always a guy and the stay-at-home -home person isn't always a woman. Um, and have a think about that when you're, you're setting your scenarios and tasks. Um, there's heaps of other things. All the RBA speeches are great. Uh, Lucy talked about an article she wrote this, uh, uh, this morning and she spoke about, I think, something she did in Geelong in 2019 about um, unemployment and the participation rate in the United States. Um, obviously, the board minutes are dense, but they are accessible, obviously, to a teacher. But Clearly, the, the key thing is the monetary policy decision. That's, that's the big one. Um, I love the statement on monetary policy and that, you know, my students think that makes me a bit sad, but they have some great, char they have some great charts and boxes in there. And there's charts you won't find in the chart pack. And there's boxes explaining big issues that are happening at the moment in the economy that are really impacting the settings of monetary policy. And they could be things like, I'm, I'm just trying to think what was in the most recent one. I mean, you know, it could be an analysis of the impact of, of the, the, the fiscal interventions during the pandemic, or it could be a discussion of um, the unconventional monetary policy. It, and they're really, really valuable and look somewhat reasonably readable. And the document's searchable as well. So it's a p searchable PDF, which I find great. Um, one final thing, we need to be promoting economics. Um, Alex Heath, years ago, back in December 2017, looked at some data and did a, a talk on the skills for the modern workforce. So the, what, what the modern workforce needs is people who can um, use the kind of cognitive skills that economics provides students with. In particular, those sort of non-routine jobs are growing. The more routine jobs that are 
less likely to draw on the kind of analytical skills that you develop when you study economics and the critical thinking skills are actually shrinking. And we need to be promoting this to our students. Um, and also there is a money bonus and you know, economists know it's all about incentives. Uh, there are premiums involved in having those skills. So maths, cognitive and analytical skills. I'm not saying you have to study maths to do economics, but um, the kind of analytical skills and the critical thinking skills that we encourage students to develop in economics are very valuable. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the RBA's email service. That's where they will remind you every time they send you something in and you can choose what you want to be emailed about. So make sure you subscribe and you'll get notifications every time they bring out a new explainer or any um, new information. And let's reverse this trend in the downward slide of economics. That's it.